Rolling. Today's box office is ruled by the superhero genre. Out of the top 40 highest grossing films in the past 10 years, from 2008 to 2018, 13 have been superhero films, and 10 of the 13 have been from the Marvel franchise. I personally have been a longtime fan of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, or MCU, and I know the movies pretty well. And I've never questioned why I love the heroes, that is, until a few months ago. I was watching the first Iron Man solo film, Iron Man, 2008. Tony Stark. Visionary. Genius. American Patriot. That's what first caught my attention. Visionary, sure. Genius, definitely. But American Patriot? It was an odd choice of words, especially since the franchise also has Captain America, a.k.a. Steve Rogers, a so far unquestioned embodiment of American values, and the two clash all the time. Could they possibly stand for the same values and share the same traits? To me, that didn't really make sense, but perhaps they were just showing the traits in different ways, or maybe they bodied, embodied the trait at different times, depending on the situation. Perhaps the reason why Americans look up to Iron Man and Captain America is because they re represent ideals that Americans already admire. I was able to get in contact with screenwriter Stephen McFeely, who co-wrote the American Captain America movies, as well as the recent two Avengers movies, Infinity War and Endgame. He told me, quote, well, first of all, when we write them, we don't really want the characters to represent anything. In fact, we try not to consider them superheroes. We write for Rogers and Stark, not Cap and Iron Man. If we were trying to make them represent something greater than themselves, we would probably fail to make them human at all. That said, they each certainly have a consistency of character that might say something about American ideals. About Captain America, he says, quote, Rogers has to balance loyalty to his country's ideals with loyalty to his government. And in that conflict, at least in our minds, the ideals always win out. And what are those ideals? Things like freedom and fairness. About Iron Man, he says, quote, As a powerful nation, the U.S. has obligations to the less powerful, to lead, to support, to keep peace. As a brilliant and rich person, or a powerful one, Stark learns that he has the same obligation. That confirmed in my mind that I was onto something. I dug further and found that maybe three researchers had questioned the topic, but they had failed to reliably state how they determined what traits were valued by Americans. They said American ideals support this or that is American, but there was a lack of proof. One of the sources was cancelled out because he made his argument based on a fact that was directly refuted by McFeely, who I judged to be the better source. And so the question remained, are Iron Man and Captain America American ideals? And if so, why do they clash so often? I soon realized that trying to prove the two as American ideals was futile. As they were created first for an American audience, the characters were created to appeal to that audience. They are, by default, American ideals. So my first question went from a yes or no question to more of an analysis. How were they showing the qualities that Americans admire? The first step was to identify what American ideals were. This was perhaps the most subjective part of my research, and so, to combat any one person's perspective from tainting my results, I drew from a wide variety of sources. I first examined nine propaganda posters from World War II, which were created to target a large American audience and had a low chance of a single person's bias. I also looked at two essays from President Theodore Roosevelt titled American Ideals and True Americanism as well as the inaugural addresses of Presidents Reagan and Kennedy, which also addressed, uh, were addressed to the larger American audience and relied upon American patriotism. To cover any other gaps I might have missed, I also checked to see what American author Mark Twain, President Truman, and revolutionary writers Patrick Henry and Benjamin Franklin had to say on the subject. I identified the traits that the various sources promoted and synthesized them into this statement. The American ideal is brave, a team player, focuses on defense and peace, but will fight for freedom. He or she is also independent, driven, creative, compassionate, humble, and level-headed. Having established the ideals portion of my research, I went on to film analysis. In total, the MCU has 22 films, with nine more currently in production. Instead of watching all the films, which while entertaining, would not serve me well as Stark and Rogers don't appear in half of them, I created a list of criteria a film had to meet in order to be studied. 
One, the film must be part of the MCU, or Marvel Cinematic Universe. Two, the film must have Captain America or, and or Iron Man. And three, Captain America or Iron Man must be a significant character. I ended up with nine films. Iron Man, Iron Man 2, Captain America the First Avenger, The Avengers, Iron Man 3, Captain America the Winter Soldier, Avengers Age of Ultron, Captain America Civil War, and Avengers Infinity War. Each movie was two to two and a half hours long with anywhere from 50 to 80 scenes in each film. I decided to break down each one scene by scene, taking note of the purpose of the scene, so why it remained in the film, uh, the actions of Stark and Rogers, and any notable quotes from either other characters talking about the two heroes or from the characters themselves that revealed their perspectives and motives. So, with my data gathered, I started to compare the American ideals with the film observations, going from trait to trait to see if Rogers or Stark lived up to the ideal. If of the ten ideals, we're going to touch on five of them. Acting in defense is a key value, and I found that both fit the bill in different ways. Rogers is reactionary, while Stark is proactive. With Rogers, he always waits for the other person to make an aggressive move before he himself moves to combat it. As seen in the news. That's the punishment usually came after the crime. Every time someone tries to win a war before it starts, innocent people die. Every time. Stark, in contrast, wants to fortify his home in order to protect those he loves. He wants to be three steps ahead of the threat at all times. Pepper experiences this in Iron Man 3. We're going out of town. Okay, we've been through this. Nope. Yeah. Wanda experiences it in Civil War when he confines her to the Avengers base. In Age of Ultron, we see him move on from fortifying his home to fortifying the entire world. I see a suit of armor around the world. As such a heavy advocate for defense, Stark is also an advocate for peace. In his first two scenes ever, he says... Yeah, peace. I like peace. We got a job at peace. It's an imperfect world, but it's the only one we've got. I guarantee you the day weapons are no longer needed to keep the peace, I'll start making bricks and beans for making hospitals. His goal of peace extends beyond just his origin story, as we see in Age of Ultron. Peace in our time. Imagine that. Isn't that the why we fight so we can end the fight so we get to go home? It seemed at first like Stark fit the ideal more than Rogers did at this point, but there was one thing that wasn't quite in line. President Reagan says, Peace is the highest aspiration of the American people. We will negotiate for it, sacrifice for it, we will not surrender for it. Benjamin Franklin says, They that can give up essential liberty to obtain a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. In Civil War, Stark is willing to give up all personal freedoms for the Sokovia Accords. We need to be put in check. Whatever form that takes, I'm getting. It seems as though Stark has crossed the line. Rogers, on the other hand, is opposed to the Accords from the get-go, and never agrees to sacrifice freedom for protection. Protection? Is that how you see this? This is protection? It's internment. Another American trait is fighting for freedom. Even though Stark doesn't fight for freedoms in Civil War, he likes his space. He doesn't share his suits with the government. America is secure. You want my property? You can't have it! Rogers also protects his freedom, but not just in Civil War. In The Winter Soldier, he says... Yeah, we compromised, sometimes in ways that made us not sleep so well, but we did it so that people could be free. This isn't free. All in all, they both fight for freedom, but Rogers tends to hold it closer to his heart than Stark does. Moving on, Stark has only recently learned the value of compassion. Before he changes to really care for others, he ditches Rhodey, his best friend, all the time, and he leaves starry-eyed Aldrich Killian alone on a roof late one night. After a bit of character growth, however, he has become more compassionate. Mostly you see it in his face, especially in Civil War, when he hears about the death of a stranger's son, and when Peter Parker is explaining his motives for being a vigilante. Rogers, on the other hand, was chosen to be Captain America solely for his compassion. The head scientist of the project tells him this. The serum amplifies everything that is inside, so good becomes great. his 
compassion when he jumps on a grenade to save his fellow soldiers, and when he takes the time to sit down with Black Widow and Scarlet Witch. Compassion is integral to Roger's leadership style. One of the two areas where they differ the most is in level-headedness. It is here that I think the main conflict between the two lies. Rogers is level-headed, able to make strategic decisions and give orders in the middle of absolute chaos. <laughs> but you can see how, he compo how composed he is in Age of Ultron when he, along with the, ma with the majority of the team, are shown their worst fears. He remains collected, so much so that Stark even points out... Seems like you worked away, right? In contrast, Stark is an absolute mess. Wanda even says, I saw Stark's fear. I knew it would control him, make him self-destruct. It seems like in almost every film, he is completely blinded by an overpowering emotion or mental state. In Iron Man 2, it's severe death anxiety. In Iron Man 3, it's PTSD. In Age of Ultron, it's fear. In Civil War, it's guilt. Very rarely is Stark's head ever clear enough to make a logical decision. The other area where they differ the most, besides level-headedness, is in humility. Stark is most certainly not humble, and he knows it. Textbook narcissism. Agreed? The difference is best seen when Stark and Rogers get their medals of honor. Rogers earns his after he rescues the 107th on his own. When the award ceremony comes around, he ditches in favor of strategizing in the war room. Stark earns his after defeating an army of drones with another armored hero. When the award ceremony comes up, he pulls some strings and gets his political enemy to personally present the award. <laughs> He's so smug, beaming through the whole thing. He's so proud of himself. So, to recap, Tony Stark and Steve Rogers represent American ideals to varying degrees but they clash so much because Stark's lack of control over his emotions makes him unpredictable, and thus causes conflict with Roger's level-headedness. Stark's pride also serves as an obstacle in their relationship. Now, this would be interesting to fans of the series, but does it really matter in the long run? I think yes, because it's a resource that we've been largely overlooking. I mentioned earlier that I hit a roadblock of sorts once I realized that, one, there was no list of American ideals that I could use, and two, it was almost impossible to prove the heroes as American ideals because that's what they were created to be. It was like trying to define a word without using the word in the definition. Upon realizing that the definition didn't exist yet, I also realized that popular culture could be a treasure trove when it came to finding out what a people of a time valued. We already do this with ancient peoples. For example, when we study the Aeneid, we can see a shift in heroism from one that involves glorious death in battle to one that is focused on protecting those you are in charge of. Why aren't we really doing this with more recent fiction? My guess is that pop culture, especially for film, is looked down upon. After all, superheroes have been accused of killing the film industry, and there are those who are still teased for liking them. But the facts are these. Superheroes have stuck around for a long time, and they have only become more popular. Avengers Endgame broke 100... 1.2 billion dollars in its first two days alone, making it the highest gross opening weekend of all time. In order to understand the values of people today, we should be looking at and analyzing the movies that they keep talking about, that they take their kids to see. This applies to other franchises too, Star Wars and Harry Potter, really any franchise where the protagonist is seen as a hero. Those could tell us about trends and values between generations or even nationwide ideals. We've told stories about heroes for thousands of years, and we've put them on the side that we judge as good. What we define as good, what we value, those things are reflected in what we create. And even though we may not be able to see what those ideals are, we can look at the reflection and see what it's reflecting. Thank you, Kaylee. Uh, how is the method or process you chose aligned with the purpose of your research? Which methods did you consider and reject? I considered um, getting more of a survey sort of perspective from American Ideals and trying to get as many people to tell me what they thought American Ideals were. Um, but I realized that that's such an abstract, abstract question that when you ask people, even when I brought it up in conversation, people would say, uh, freedom. 
and they wouldn't they wouldn't really know where to go from there. So I went instead and tried to do a literature review or content analysis sort of uh, way of tackling that that topic. Thank you. Thanks, Kaylee. Um, my question is, what criteria did you use to discriminate among different perspectives in order to reach a conclusion? A lot of the um, a lot of the different people who had given their two cents before on American ideals and superheroes had um, tried to say this character is um, either Republican or Democrat, and so a lot of those sources I had to cancel out because they conflicted with each other. Almost never did two articles agree. Um, I also decided to go instead with um, kind of treating what McFeely said as my map of sorts. If it agreed with what he said about the characters, then it was eligible. Uh. Uh, which of your sources was the most influential, and in what way is that influence apparent in your final conclusion or results? Well, McFeely for one, <laughs> but I think also another area that was very influential for me was the, um, the inaugural speeches of Reagan and Kennedy. I found a lot of traits from American ideals that I did not expect to find okay. in their speeches. Um, I found a lot of different areas where they kind of differed as well that would have been interesting to look into. Like there was this one point where something Kennedy said lined up with more Stark perspective and something Reagan said was more Rogers. And I would have loved to get into that, but it was a little bit too uh, too deep for 5,000 words. So. All right. <laughs>